The number of confirmed COVID-19 infections in Africa stood at 1.2 million plus on Sunday as countries on the continent continue to report a decline in new infections. The latest figures from the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that the continent has reported 29,430 deaths. South Africa remains the hardest hit country on the continent, having reported 622,551 cases and 13,981 deaths. The numbers represent 50.3% of the continent's caseload and 47.5% of its deaths. Egypt is the second worst hit country in Africa, having re registered 98,497 infections and 5,376 deaths. Other than the top two most affected countries, Morocco, 60,056 and Nigeria, 53,727 are the only other African countries that have recorded more than 50,000 COVID-19 infections. The continent has, however, seen a recent decline in new cases, pointing towards progress in its fight against the virus. To help us take a look at some West African countries and how they are faring in the face of the sustained pandemic, we have Dr. Courage Ohumwago from Joss University Teaching Hospital uh, joining us. We also have Dr. Yusuf Yakubu from Accra, Ghana, as well as Umar Chifan from Cameroon. Thank you very much, uh, doctors, for joining us on The Breakfast. Let's begin with you, Dr. Courage. What is Thank your- Thank you for having me this morning. It's our pleasure. Dr. Courage, let's start with you. What is your assessment of the COVID-19 situation? Um, have we flattened the curve? Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, while it is obvious that the cases are coming down, uh, there are still pockets of uh, high cases recorded in different places. Like you mentioned about Plateau State. Um, those of us in Plateau State, we cannot say that we are flattening the curve um, because the, the cases are still very, the number of cases we are recording are still very high. And for those of us in teaching hospital, for instance, our, our wards are full of um, COVID-19 cases, you know, so the isolation world is virtually all the time, always overflowing. Um, you know, so at this moment, uh, globally and uh, regionally, we might be coming down when you aggregate uh, the total number of cases. But when you narrow down to the pockets of uh, uh, places, it, we cannot exactly say that is the case. All right, Dr. Omar, current statistics shows Cameroon has over 19,000 cases with some 17,000 recovered with 411 deaths. Um, help us understand the situation today. The figure still seems to be on the high. How has this um, affected Cameroonians? Thank you. Uh, good morning once more. And uh, so far, I think uh, the figures are what they are, 19,600, because uh, there has been an improved testing in all the districts, in all the government hospitals. At the moment, what we have is uh, all the hospitals have a free test that they give. Uh, they, any patient who comes with symptoms is being given. So with the sociopolitical crisis, it's been a bit uh, difficult in those and in the Anglophone regions of Cameroon to access the places. So most of those people there they have free tests in their hospitals and i think uh, there are some uh, cases new cases which are recorded every day or every week with the analysis making that uh, number to be very high and also i would say access to medication is a bit difficult at this time and uh, the other towns which are uh, much more uh, urbanized and they have uh, they have they really seem like they are, they have arrived at the curve. They have, they flatten the curve because you get to the population, you don't even see them aware about anything and keeping uh, all the measures to prevent the transmission. So I think uh, we have a rise, we have a problem, and uh, it's still in Cameroon uh, very strongly compared to other other nations. Um, we will come to Dr. Yakubu in a bit, but stay with you, uh, Dr. Omar. It, are there particular areas that concern yes. you? I mean, counties or states in Cameroon that 
particularly worries the government and what is being done to ensure that those places have contained cases as much as possible? What is being done in Cameroon is at the central level, we uh, have... Uh... Dr. Mar, my question is actually about counties, yes. communities. Is there a particular location that has sort of um, come to the fore as the one with uh, the highest number of cases? Yes. The capital city, Yaoundé, has the highest number of cases. We would say that because uh, there is a relative uh, high population density and uh, other places like Douala, they also report uh, a higher number of cases. We will also notice that uh, most of these towns, they have a mass uh, influx of people because of the crisis. So many people run from other regions and go to those places, and that can account for a surge in the number of uh, cases that they have. Uh, let's take another example, Bamenda, for example. The, of the towns mostly are those in the regions, in the various regions, which have uh, reported higher cases. When we have the population, many people are there. They don't have... Uh, sometimes they even think they don't trust the government. They don't think the coronavirus is a real pandemic which is existing. They just think the government wants to exploit it for ulterior motives. And that's what really makes the people... You see patients coming come to the hospital in advanced stages, they need respirators and all of that. The hospital wards are all crowded, and then some even present uh, with you. Uh, they bring a cops to the hospital. You want to ask, they present to you the symptoms which were like these patients were uh, suspected of having. Good morning, please. You have to call me back. I'm in a meeting right now. All right, um, Dr. Yakubu, uh, I guess we'll have to put you on the spot now. Dr. Yakubu, can you hear me? Dr. Yakubu, can you hear me? All right, let's, let's uh, go back to uh, Mr. Omar. We'll stay with you for a bit and see how soon we can get uh, Mr. Yakubu to join in uh, on the conversation. Um, the level of compliance seemed to be a problem across board. How are people complying with all the regulations put forward uh, to protect people of Cameroon? Do we have Dr. Umar? For now, um, before, for now, the Ministry of uh, Public Health has uh, developed a preparedness plan, which has, uh, with, it includes like active surveillance at various points of entry and uh, in-country diagnostic capacity building. So we have, uh, we have uh, businesses, churches and offices and most schools which have reopened and they maintain their normal hours. And uh, what is being done, let's say, at the entry points, you must present with a COVID negative test. That's a PCR. That's a, before you enter, which is not older than three days. So I think that at that level, that is, uh, it's, it's much more advanced in controlling the people who come in with uh, either suspected cases. What, and if you come in, if, you, if you're tested at the airport, and you're positive, they would offer you confinement and treatment, which is all for free. That's some uh, quarantine. So okay. the government also provides a facility testing for in all 10 regions. There's a, a free number to call, 1510, to get most uh, information that you need. And uh, commercial transporting agencies are operating, like I said, but the borders in Cameroon officially remain closed, but only access to airlines, which has been given, and uh, the control at the entry points. Mask right. wearing, for example, is mandatory in all public transportation and uh, for safety reasons unrelated to COVID. So okay. um, um, fines have been placed also for... For people who don't put on masks in public places, you have a fine to pay of 6,000 francs. And uh, I think uh, so far, that is uh, what we have for, for Cameroon. 
All right, let's see if we can um, have Mr. Yakubu speak to us now. Um, uh, we apologize for the break uh, in the connection. That's our new normal uh, with technology, trying to have conversations virtually. Dr. Yakubu, can you hear me? Okay, let's go back to Dr. Courage. Um, Dr. Courage, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fantastic. Let's talk about prior to the pandemic, um, I mean, during the peak of the pandemic, actually, um, we had cases of complaints that other um, aspects of health care was being neglected as a result of focus on caring for those with the COVID-19 um, uh, virus. What is the situation now? Are people getting the needed attention? The outcry then, was it impactful enough to cause change when it comes to caring for other patients other than those with COVID-19? Thank you for the question. I, I think that um, the generally everything is about opened now. Uh, we're almost back to you know, the, uh, our normal practices. Um, in the hospital and even around, which is probably why we're also having the increasing number of cases, you know, because uh, the community takes it like, oh, once they say there's relaxation of lockdown, that means everything is fine. You know, people go about, you know, they're doing the things that they normally would do. Even on the streets, you find it difficult. You find that most people don't even wear, you know, their face mask and all the other measures put in place. But coming back to the hospital, um, yeah, our, our clinics and our wards are running maybe at, at least 75% of the capacity now, uh, where the uh, theaters and all of that are still being uh, controlled. But most of the patients are getting the kind of the care that they normally would have gotten um, before uh, COVID. What changed that? I'm not quite sure. It is the it is the outcry from you know uh, the patients about you know Hello. getting care as against being cared for by COVID patient. I think, um, cared for, caring for COVID patient. I think it was the fact that government, um, you know, putting all the things Hello? together, including the economic downturn, you know, and all of that, could not really cope, um, you know, with the impact of COVID-19 if we were to remain, you know, uh, running at very low capacity of the hospital, closing down the economy and every other thing that we were doing at that time. You know, so it became quite difficult to sustain that. That wasn't sustainable at all. And so because of that, um, we have to start getting back to, you know, things as they were. And that also provided the opportunity for patients with other conditions uh, apart from COVID to also start getting their care as much as uh, was possible. You know, so I think that's why um, we have reverted back to, you know, uh, the way it was before then. But the problem with that is, there's increased exposure, there's increased number of cases, you know, in, in the population. Back to you in a bit, but let's bring uh, Dr. Yakubu. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? We're happy to know uh, you can. All right. The last time you were on the show, you indicated that there is a level of a lack of compliance among Ghanaians in terms of observing uh, the uh, protocols put in place to safeguard against the spread of the virus. Where is the nation now? Have people simply moved on, as we say in Nigeria, something muscular man? Okay, um, it's it's an it would be important to note that the president um, usually every week or every two weeks addresses the nation and then talks about the various steps or how the government wants to ease the restrictions that have been imposed on the country because of the COVID nineteen pandemic. And there is the, during these addresses, the president tends to um, um, remind um, Ghanaians that they should know that not wearing nose masks or not observing the um, protocols are punishable. I think the president reiterated this yesterday when he addressed the nation for the 16th time and then reminded Ghanaians that they should not forget that not wearing nose masks or not observing um, um, the protocols are punishable. So um, we are hoping that people would remember that not um, observing these protocols um, can attract punishment and jail terms or fines, and then hoping that people take things more seriously. The fact that Ghana is having the highest recovery 
about 96 percent in the country in the sub region is kind of like making people even more relaxed and they feel like oh the problem is not a big deal in this part of the world so why should i worry but then people should be worried because the virus there's a lot about it that we don't know there's a lot of a lot about it that we don't know so uh, are you that's, are you that's expecting what some to, uh, that's uh, what i have to say about that Okay, are you expecting a resurgence? Because, um, I mean, a lot of states, the Africa CDC says we're almost flattening uh, the curve across uh, many countries in the continent. Is that the situation in Ghana, or is the fear that there will be a resurgence higher than the optimism that the curve has been flattened? Um, for flattening the curve, I think it's a term that I've become very... Uh, um, common in the public space and i i don't think it's what we should be looking at we should be looking at more from a resurgence angle and then take preventive steps instead of thinking of a curve because as i said earlier one of the scary thing about the covid 19 virus is a lot of things about it is not known a few days ago in hong kong thereabouts there was a reinfection somebody who had gotten the virus developed immunity and is fine happened to um, um, report again to have had the virus, which means that the virus is replicating, it's changing, and this could lead to all kinds of um, um, resurgence in the future that we don't know about. So we should think more from the angle of what if there is a resurgence? What if there is a spike? Why don't we work hard to prevent the spread of the virus rather than think of flattening the curve for something that um, keeps changing, for something that because Ghana mapped a genome trying to find out if the virus here is different from that that was discovered in other parts of the world. And they found out that the one found here has some slight difference with um, um, some of the ones that, are, um, um, that were originally reported. And this is scary. And more and more of this is being reported. So we should think more from an angle of uh, resurgence than an angle of flattening the curve, which kind of like makes us more relaxed and feel like, okay, things are under control and then these protocols are not so important as we should take them. Uh, fair enough. Um, Miss Dr. Yakubu, I, um, I'm still with you, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, I, I, I spoke with uh, Dr. Huango earlier, and he talked about the particular area uh, where they're having uh, some challenges. So I want to ask you, Greater Accra region seems to have the highest number of cases. What is being done uh, in your thinking that is going to help uh, to reduce the level of infection being reported uh, from that region? With Greater Accra has the highest, that is true. And um, the government is working at opening the borders. And then before now, they had kind of like... Um, there are infectious centers in the international airports just to help with um, checking and then um, people who are coming in trying to check and see if it would be relatively safe to open the borders now. Aside that too, there is a rehashing of the observance of safety protocol. Ghana together with the, in partnership with the private sector built a 100 bed capacity infectious disease center which is um, something which I think it's in the right direction because this is the epicenter. This is the highest um, um, infectious, um, how do you call it, um, recorded infection in the country. So setting up of these facilities as well as ensuring that um, there is a testing center directly at the airport for people who are coming in, um, either um, Ghanaians who are returning or people who are coming in for whatever reason, are steps that are taken to make sure that these numbers do not rise because the numbers keep going down in Ghana because the new recorded cases are 87. We used to have about 700, 800. The new cases um, as such yesterday was just 87. Even though, um, as I said, we should be more careful, but then um, the, the, the government is doing what it can. The education, the building of these facilities, installation of these facilities at the airports, are ways um, the government is introducing to try and then keep the curve that way, uh, reduce it as much as possible. All right, let's go back to Cameroon and find out um, uh, the situation. There are crises there, uh, some really turbulent um, situation uh, in parts of the country. How really? 
Are you with me, Dr. Umar? Dr. Umar, can yes, you hear I am. me? Okay. Uh, how have you been me? able to manage, you know, manage yes. a pandemic? I mean, some real tension uh, in the country. With the tension in the country, uh, some uh, I think when the pandemic came, it humbled a few persons and they actually had to stop a little. So there was some period where there was calm, but uh, I think uh, right now people are coming to get uh, the real information that the virus kills. So most people now focus on uh, using non-governmental organizations to go into the places where are most afflicted by the crisis to create those uh, centers for uh, testing and treatment because the government gives the testing for free. So um, NGOs and other uh, institutions struggle to take uh, the tests and medications to those places which are very difficult to reach because of the crisis. And uh, the idea in some parts is not welcome. People tend to say, oh no, it's the government struggling to inflict illness into people and uh, they shouldn't uh, take what the government is taking because they are coming to inject a virus in them. So those places are a bit hostile. Some people have actually been, uh, we've helped cases where people are killed because uh, they were doing uh, humanitarian work in uh, those affected areas and it's been difficult. The doctors are exposed and there is not also uh, enough uh, material for the health personnel who are the front line. And, uh, Generally, people don't trust what, like I said earlier, people don't trust what the government is uh, taking. So there's a call for increased awareness and uh, for the population to be able to take what uh, we, we have, which is affecting the world at, as of now. All right. Um, let's come back to Dr. Ohuango. Um, Dr. Yakubu um, talked about us not focusing on flattening off the curve, but on a possible resurgence. I want to talk to you about the situation in Nigeria. In Lagos State, for instance, uh, the government has okayed the resumption of schools and other social gathering, um, social um, uh, places. Um, should the conversation um, move from curbing the virus to managing to live with it for as long as it persists. What is your assessment of the decision, not only of Lagos state government, but other state governments to reopen schools, worship places, and the likes? Thank you again for the question. I, I think it's, it's a step in the right direction because, uh, you know, this has been more than six months now. Okay, how, how long are we going to be, you know, locked down? How long are we going to keep, you know, uh, being this way? It will, even globally, everybody's reassessing, you know, the, the way forward. So I think the decision by Lagos State government, yes, is right. And according to like what Dr. Yakubu said, we have to really be focusing. And I've said this sometimes ago on this program. We should forget about the curve. We should not be looking, even the so-called modeling that they are using. You know, we've had issues with different kind of models. Somebody come up with something and then a few weeks down the line, we see that, no, it's not working and all of that. Let's focus on the cases and the individuals and the region, okay, where we are having, you know, spikes and all of that. And move in there, curtail it, deal with it at that level and move on. You know, so if you are opening, um, if you are opening tertiary institutions, for instance, like Lagos State is considering doing, First of all, massive education, massive education. And good enough, tertiary institutions are supposed to be places for adults, you know, so they should be able to take responsibility, you know, for uh, the various protocols that are put in place. So they need to be educated on, on how to keep, um, you know, the protocols for safety. And then as they come in, you know, even they probably have to be given two kits and all of those things that will help them stay safe. And then monitor the cases. Everybody must be checked at intervals. And as the cases are rising, you must be able to isolate, you know, the causes of those rising cases and deal with it. Okay, so that, that life can move on. Life must return to normal, you know, because we do not know how long, you know, like Dr. Yakub also said, there's a lot of things we don't know about the coronavirus. Uh, one of the, 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 one of the, the myths... 
Um, sorry about. to interrupt okay. you. you. You you talked about some loads of things we don't know about the virus. Uh, one of the myths when this uh, virus started was the fact that um, the weather, when it's hot, has some um, um, impact on the virus and sort of contains um, um, it spreading uh, faster than usual. What do you say that has some bearing on the current situation of little figures being reported in most uh, parts. For Lagos State, for instance, we've not had a lot of rain in many parts. And we know that the figures are much lower and every day it seems to be um, uh, riding down. Does that have an impact? Should we expect that when the rains come back, if there is any uh, truth to the myths, that there will be a resurgence? Yeah, that was the initial thinking uh, as of the moment the, um, you know, judging from those uh, parts of the world where, you know, they've had changes in their weather and, they, you know, so we, it's difficult to really use that as a yardstick now, okay? Because, okay, look at just uh, Plateau State, for instance. We've been in the hot for a while. It's now we are moving towards the cold. Our cases have been rising while we were, in the, uh, while we were um, experiencing the hot weather here. Now we are moving towards the cold, okay? And the cases are dropping. Okay, so it's difficult to use that as a, as, as a yardstick. And I don't think as of now, um, there's any one cap fit all in dealing with this coronavirus. You know, look at what uh, Dr. Yakubu said, that when they uh, sequenced the genome in, in Ghana, they found that there was some slight difference from what has been initially reported. So we don't know. We don't know whether that still holds true. And, you know, we really don't have any data, you know, that supports that. So we cannot rely on on the force of nature to help us in fighting in this virus. What we need to do is to step up our game, always be vigilant. And I think that's where the NCDC has to step up. Well, it's not just about testing anymore. Testing, data, and action. You test, then as you map the global te uh, the, the tests across the nation, you know where the, isolate, where the, the isolated increase in cases. Then you you know, take the demography of that area and find out why should that be? What's different from this area compared to other parts of the country? And if you isolate what the issues are, you deal with those issues and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to um, break down the number of cases. If you, are, if you are relying on the information of past months, you know, to help us deal with this, uh, with this coronavirus, we are wasting our time. It's not going to work. We have to follow the virus where it goes and nip it there. And that's, I think, the way forward. And that will help us, you know, to reopen our economy and let everybody come back, you know, to work and do the things that they're supposed to be doing. All right. I'll come to you with that same question, Dr. Yakubu. But before you respond to it, I, I want to ask you um, what the situation is with the care of people at the front line. In Nigeria, at some point, there were loads of complaints that they don't have adequate PPEs. You know, some doctors say they've not been paid. At some point, some doctors even went on strike. What is the situation uh, in your part of the world? And um, what is the government uh, doing? Okay, with Ghana, I think the president announced a 50% increase in the pay of frontline workers from the very beginning. And um, during the lockdown, there was free transportation in and out for frontline workers. This included doctors, nurses, and other health professionals that were working in the hospitals up till date. Um, the frontline workers were provided with PPEs, even though there were complaints from some facilities and hospitals that they weren't having enough PPEs. Some people would have to get to the point of buying some for themselves. Some of us at some point would have to buy some for ourselves. But then um, we have this report from the BBC and that saying some people were selling, um, middlemen were selling PPEs for themselves, which um, the argument was being made that that was the reason why some frontline workers weren't getting enough PPEs. But at the moment, largely, um, a lot of these concerns have been addressed. But then... We've lost some doctors to COVID-19 and some nurses as well, some lab technicians. Yes, we've lost, we've lost some health professionals, top um, 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 surgeons to um, COVID-19 at the very early days. But it's getting better. The numbers are reducing and the deaths are not reported um, um, like it was. But then we've lost some health professionals to COVID-19. So the situation is getting better now. The government is increasing its efforts to providing um, um, health professionals with the necessary um, um, PPEs they need to work with, as well as, as I said, the increase in um, um, salary 
um, percentage is for health workers, uh, frontline workers to be precise, in the country. What's the situation in Cameroon, Doc? Dr. Meyer, what's the situation in Cameroon? Okay, I suspect we've lost... The situation in Cameroon yes, as, as regards to the frontline yes, workers? Yes, yes. With regards to the frontline workers? Yes, uh, the care the of the frontline workers, yes. Yeah. Affect. We have doctors who have actually died of uh, the infection, nurses as well, those who are exposed, they are most exposed. Provision of uh, PPEs by the government and is not very encouraging, but uh, they, are, they are trying their best to equip the hospitals with the, to provide the hospitals through other supportive bodies and uh, even hospitals also try to provide materials for their staff. But in regards to motivation, I think uh, the doctors and uh, frontline workers are generally not uh, happy because uh, of recent a certain motivation of uh, sa uh, included in salaries was cut off. So doctors were really, really mad about that. It's a very insignificant amount. But looking at our neighbors, other countries, they increase salary pays by 50 percent and so on. In our own case, it's instead demotivating. So I think it's not really encouraging. The frontline workers are very much exposed in Cameroon when you want to talk about the virus and the pandemic. We, we certainly hope that the situation improves uh, for them. Uh, the major takeaway this morning uh, from this conversation for me is we should not be so focused on flattening the curve, but ensuring that we don't um, relax Ensure that we don't relax and follow through with all the safety protocols. Thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for your time on the program. And please continue to stay safe. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure.